Hello, hello everybody and welcome. On behalf of Da Bocconi, as Director for Executive Education in Health, Government and Nonprofit, I'm honored to welcome you all to the webinar on hospital management during pandemic crisis. This event is part of the Da Bocconi Insight Initiative for disseminating knowledge and experiences within our community. I am particularly pleased to share this experience with the Melman School of Public Health of Columbia University. As you know, and you will see, this webinar hosts leaders of private and public health care systems from New York City and Italy, who are going to share the lessons they learned and are still learning from COVID-19 and how they are preparing for the future challenges. We hope that this event might be a source of inspiration for all of us, above all for your professional activities. From our side, we will integrate the lessons that we are going to learn from this dialogue in the hospital management simulation course that will take place online from the first <laughs> to the fourth of December and offered in partnership with the Mainland School of Public Health of Columbia University. Now please let me know let me leave the floor to the facilitator of this event, Michael Sparer, professor and chair in the Department of Health Policy and Management at the Mainland School of Public Health at Columbia University. Thank you, Michael. I leave you the floor. Thank you so much, Monica. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, we at the Mailman School of Public Health are just truly delighted to be collaborating and participating with Bocconi in this webinar today. Uh, and we're also just so pleased to be returning to Bocconi, albeit virtually and online, uh, in December to run the health systems simulation. So thank you for having us. Uh, and thank you to all of the participants who are with us today on the panel and to the few hundred. I mean, I understand there are three to four hundred people uh, at this point with us online. So thank you to everybody. Uh, our panelists uh, are all seasoned hospital leaders, hospital professionals who have been on the front line uh, in the battle against COVID-19 helping patients while supporting and enabling their own institutions to navigate this complicated time. We're honored that they've made time to be with us today uh, and let me briefly introduce them now. Dr. Stefano Fugioli uh, is the chair of the Department of Medicine and the director of gastroenterology and transplant hepatology at the Papa Giovanni 23 Hospital in Borgiamo. Uh, many of you, I'm sure all of you, are aware that his hospital was among the first to become truly impacted uh, by COVID-19. Uh, you likely have seen him interviewed where he spoke passionately uh, about the hundreds, the 600, the 60 percent or so of the thousand hospital beds uh, in his facility that were packed with patients. He's going to share some of his experiences uh, in responding to the pandemic with us today. Art Gianelli uh, is the Chief Transformation Officer for the Mount Sinai Health System here in New York City. He's the president of Mount Sinai Morningside Hospital. Um, he has put in place over these last years a whole series of new organizational system-wide approaches and systems. Uh, and it's going to be really interesting, I think, to hear from Art today how his efforts to transform the organizational culture, how his efforts to put in place best practices and improve patient experiences, how that played out during the pandemic. Uh, on a note of personal pride, uh, Art received his MPH from us here at Mailman, and he is a distinguished member of our faculty today. So welcome, Art. Uh, Dr. Jill Massey is the Chief of Health at Elmhurst Hospital here in New York City. Uh, as many of you may know, Elmhurst is part of the New York City public hospital system, known as the New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation. Uh, it was Elmhurst, it was his hospital that uh, was referred to around the world uh, as sort of the epicenter 
of the COVID-19 crisis for a long period of time uh, here in New York City. Uh, Dr. Massey was sort of at the heart of Elmhurst's efforts to deal with that crisis. Uh, Dr. Massey is also a professor of medicine at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Welcome to all three of you and to Monica. Uh, and just, I'm, I'm really happy to be participating in this event with you. Let, let me start with you, Stefano. Uh, you know, it was, I guess, in January, the end of January, that the first, you know, tourists from Wuhan, the first two tourists from Wuhan were sort of identified as being infected with the virus in Rome. Uh, and then just a few weeks later, the first Italian citizens, uh, I think, believe on February 22nd, uh, were sort of tested and were determined to have the COVID virus uh, in your in your community, in, in Bergamo. Uh, and at that point, it soon began the community spread uh, and, and to sort of almost overwhelm the hospital system. Let me ask you a question, and then I'm going to ask uh, Art and Joe the same question uh, sort of, to sort of follow up on it. If you knew back then what you know now about dealing with this crisis, uh, what would you have done differently, if anything, you know, given sort of the, you know, the, the, the lessons that you've learned over the last several months? Stefano, let me turn to you. Yeah, I, I have to say that it's a terrifying question. Uh, <laughs> and my answer is not going to be that politically correct. Uh, what I'm saying is that, uh, on day one, uh, even before having the first patient admitted to our hospital, we set up a crisis unit just to decide what to do. Because we, it was clear that something unexpected and unprecedented was happening in our country and specifically in our area. And so everything worked fine uh, as, as an organization in our hospital. The problem is that the system, uh, which is uh, leading the, the, the health system in Italy, uh, is basically a total fracture between the hospitals and the territory. And with the pandemic uh, ongoing, uh, you can't afford having large hospital where organization and efficiency is the, the part of the, the core of the business and having the territory being totally isolated and unorganized to, to, to face this pandemic. So what I would do differently is having a, a, a system with tight and synchronized activity and organization between large hospital and the territory. Having said that, I have to say that unfortunately, we do not have it set as of now. Wow. So we're going to come back uh, in a few minutes, Stefano. That's really interesting and really important, particularly as you talk about the macro environment that you're involved in. So I want to come back to that for a minute in a minute. But first, let me turn to Art and Joe, really with the same question. Uh, if you knew then what you knew now, what you know now, uh, how, might, how might Elmhurst and, and sort of Mount Sinai Morningside responded differently? Uh, Art, do you want to, you want to take a, a crack at that? So I want to thank everybody for um, uh, uh, for inviting me to participate in this panel. It's 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 um, it, it's very interesting to hear from our colleagues in Italy, um, and I think the experiences that we had in New York are are genuinely valuable um, for the rest of the country uh, and the world, uh, particularly as it, second waves uh, um, could hit a number of our different um, countries. So I think a few things uh, I would I would identify as as being areas that if if we knew now uh, if we knew if we knew that back then what we know now uh, I would have done differently. Number one, um, we clearly did not have sufficient uh, personal protective equipment and ventilators in reserve, and either. Uh, um, we, we need to make a decision as a state and uh, as, as, a, as a health system, as a state and as a country about whether, whether stockpiling personal protective equipment, ventilators is a function of hospitals or is a function of the government. And, and, and unfortunately, we, we, we worked that out during the peak of the crisis. Uh, ideally, that would have been decided and sooner and we would have had 
the, the stockpiles in place to, uh, to draw from. Um, second, uh, we were building our surge plan as the um, pandemic came upon us and as the number of patients that we were seeing um, increased on a daily and a weekly basis. Uh, uh, again, in an ideal world, and we're now positioned this way, by the way, um, in an ideal world, we would have had these surge plans in place so we could have been have moved immediately to execution as opposed to having to spend critical time in design in figuring out how best to, to, to surge within our respective hospitals. Um, third, we would have deployed resources, critical resources, to our community hospitals sooner, and that includes Elmhurst. Um, the hospitals, at, at least in New York, the hospitals that were in the outer boroughs in the community um, were so much uh, harder hit uh, than the hospitals in Manhattan. And, uh, um, you know, our hospitals were overwhelmed uh, in the outer boroughs. So our hospitals in Queens and our hospitals in Brooklyn were simply overwhelmed. I think if we had it to do all over again, we would have positioned resources in the outer boroughs sooner and become be, it begun transfers uh, uh, more aggressively uh, sooner, and we would have had in place plans to be able to stand up uh, as many makeshift ICU beds as we could um, as quickly as possible in the community. Um, and then finally, I think we, it's certainly in New York, needed to have identified a strategy early on to discharge nursing home patients from hospitals to some other location to recover. Um, the, the, the challenge in New York was that, that, that all of us thought, uh, based upon our modeling, that the, that, that the hospitals are going to be overwhelmed very, very quickly. We're going to be overwhelmed very, very quickly by, by a, a surge of, of COVID positive patients. We were, we hit the tipping point, but we weren't overwhelmed, it, it turned out, but nobody knew that at the time. So the decision making was that, you know, to the extent that a nursing home patient was admitted to a hospital and can be, could be returned back to a nursing home, that, that that needed to happen in order to clear beds in the hospital for additional admissions. That turned out to be a, 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 a big mistake. Um, lives were lost because of that decision. And the, and the better play would have been to identify alternative locations to discharge nursing home patients. So they could have been cleared out of the hospital, so the hospitals could have accepted more admissions, but that they wouldn't have gone back to nursing homes which simply couldn't have handled these patients. So those are the four things that I think, uh, uh, Michael, that that, it, 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 that immediately come to mind, that if we had an opportunity to do things over again, um, which we may very well in the, in the, in the coming weeks and months, um, that, that we need to do better this the second time around. Great. Thanks, Owen. That's, that's really helpful. Uh, and I know some of these issues, such as the nursing home uh, debacle, we might say, that uh, is getting a lot of attention these days, and I think it's going to turn into a, quite a political football as well. Joe, you were on the, on the front lines at Elmhurst, uh, you know, and I remember personally sitting home uh, in, in my apartment and watching on the television just the, the scenes from, from Elmhurst Hospital in particular. Uh, obviously, you were in the midst of a, of a you know, overwhelming crisis, unexpected, scary, confusing, complicated crisis. But again, same question, looking back uh, on, on sort of the response that you had way back in, in the height of it, back in March, if you knew then what you know now, you know, building maybe a little bit off what you've heard both from Stefano and Art, uh, what would you do differently? Well, there are, there are several categories um, to answer that question. Uh, I think because we were so quickly overwhelmed, we have a 500-bed hospital here with 200 medical beds, and it was very quickly overwhelmed with new patients coming in from the community, um, and we had hundreds a day in the emergency department who needed admission. One thing that, in retrospect, um, we needed to do was to create a very, very tight system for tracking people who were not admitted, who came to the emergency department but were not um, critical enough to be hospitalized. Uh, many of those patients uh, were lost track of when they left, uh, and we don't really have a full uh, understanding of what happened to them after that. And I think that is an illustration of the other problem, uh, and that is the fact that the 
Hospitals in New York are not uh, well distributed across this um, city. We are the largest hospital in the borough of Queens. We have a catchment area of about 1.1 million people, and we have 500 beds. Um, we were sort of uh, in a position to be rapidly overwhelmed by anything that was quickly expanding like this was. Luckily for us, we're part of a network of 11 hospitals that work reasonably closely together in the Health and Hospitals Corporation. So once the magnitude of this problem was recognized, we were able to start um, uh, triaging uh, patients according to which of our hospitals within the entire system was busiest and which had capacity. Now, Elmhurst was hit uh, hardest, earliest, so we transferred patients out uh, to other hospitals that were not immediately impacted to this degree. They were all subsequently impacted, um, but it allowed us a little bit of um, breathing room to create facilities within our hospital to house the really sickest patients who we were seeing uh, while we were able to transfer some to other hospitals. Now, there are a couple of uh, medical concerns in that. Number one, it was not always easy to tell how stable a patient was. Were they stable enough to be transferred? We saw patients rapidly deteriorate in some instances. So it took uh, a developed uh, sense of uh, medical understanding of this condition that wasn't always there immediately. And then second, there are facilities within our hospital that even during prior surge exercises, we hadn't really thought of as places where we could actually house ICU level patients, but we quickly developed them and discovered them, post-operative uh, uh, units, um, endoscopy units, et cetera. Um, they were quickly recognized as units that we could actually place patients in who needed to be on ventilators, et cetera. The biggest problem for us was staffing. We did not have the staff needed to take care of so many sick patients. Luckily for us, we have volunteers from all over the country who came to us, uh, volunteers from elsewhere in New York and from all four branches of the U.S. military came to us. Uh, and I think we were fortunate certainly in that regard. I think the circumstances now both worldwide and in the United States are that uh, there are um, outbreaks all over the place now and it won't be as easy to focus uh, national help in one area like the, like it was then. Um, so the, the lessons we've learned are uh, to a large extent how to maybe more quickly develop an expanded capacity. We did open up a hospital uh, on Roosevelt Island uh, for some of our patients. Uh, the um, uh, Billie Jean King Cancer uh, Tennis Center was arranged uh, to take more patients, but as we came to the uh, peak of the crisis, it became clear to us that some of those extra beds would not actually be needed. So it was, you know, a tragic situation. We were quickly overwhelmed. Uh, we reached the peak of it relatively quickly, all in April, and we then saw a relatively rapid descent down again. Uh, so certain things were put into place quickly, certain things were put into place then, and certain things that were eventually put into place were not really needed in the end. Um, but let me stop there. I don't want to take up too much time. No, no, that's that's really interesting, really helpful. And let me just sort of say, I see there are a couple of questions that have come in. I'm going to come back. You know, what I want to do is, you know, for the first, for the next 20 minutes or so, I'm probably just going to chat with our three panelists. But I'm keeping track of, and Monica can help me keep track of, you know, some of the questions that have come in. So keep them coming, and we will really try to make an effort uh, in the last third of this seminar uh, to to get to some of your questions as well. I want to come back, uh, Stefano, to something that really all three of you raised, uh, and you started out by raising it, Stefano, and then Art, you talked about is it the, the government's responsibility or the hospital responsibility, and let's talk about PPE, you know, and let's talk about ventilators, and let's talk about testing equipment, uh, and whose responsibility uh, it is to, to do what in a crisis like this. Both the United States and Italy are federalist nations uh, in which there's a lot of authority delegated from the national government to the states or to the regional governments, et cetera, et cetera. In a crisis like this, uh, Stefano, let me start with you and then again hear from both Art and Joe on this. Uh, in a crisis like this, one of the big debates here in the United States has been, has there been enough national leadership? Should the national government have taken a greater role in sort of organizing the distribution of PPE, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? 
or is that really a state regional function? I, I think there were similar issues in Italy. Could you talk about wearing your hat as a as a hospital administrator, as a physician, as someone dealing with the crisis, dealing with these sort of multiple level of government governments? How did that play out for you, uh, and how do you think that's going to play out going forward? Well, of course, it's a complex issue. Uh, the management of the pandemic, it's by definition, and I would say even uh, over nation, uh, it shouldn't be a nation policy, it should be a world policy. Uh, so it, it's, it's a broad issue. Uh, of course, in my country, we have a central government which was releasing uh, information and you know direction and things to be done. Uh, uh, but the, the real issue is that at, at local level, you need to have a network which is organized. Uh, so you can have any fantastic and very clear direction from the center, but if the local is not organized, then you end up having problem uh, with the management of the uh, uh, nursing home or the, the general practitioner on the territory. Uh, and the, this is part of a system which has not been thought before because uh, if you want to face a pandemic, it can't be done but, 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 but one. It's only one institution uh, can't be can be in charge for that. Uh, so the point is, uh, we never had a problem as a major hospital in terms of dispositive for protection. Uh, we could get all the ventilator we needed in very short time. We moved from three to five helmet CPAP devices, which is our routine use, to 140 within one week. So that was not the issue. Uh, the issue was mainly the testing, for example. There were national guidelines for the testing, but there were only, at the beginning, the first week, only three authorized laboratory for the testing. And this means that if you're testing a patient at being admitted to the hospital, it would probably take, at the beginning of March, between 36 to 48 hours to get the answer back. Uh, and this forced us to organize the, the hospital in three different pathways. The already positive patient, the certainly negative patient, and the so-called gray area, which was the most difficult, because each of those patients need to be isolated, because it could have been positive or negative, and there was no chance to mix those patients with either one of the two groups. And this has been slowly uh, resolving simply because we were able to do the testing in-house, we got authorized, and now we have the very rapid testing for the people accessing the emergency room, which is 45 minutes, and we go as late as five hours or six hours to get the testing. This helps a lot the system, but at the very beginning, nobody was actually even thinking of getting to 100,000 testing every day, which is the limit we have reached today. So those were very first days, we were not able to do that. So it's a combination between giving clear indication from the center, but in the periphery, you need to have a strong, tight collaboration between the territory and the large hospital. And this is something which is still missing, and it's a major risk for our system. Interesting. Well, while it's still missing, uh, and while there's more to do, uh, I actually have to confess, as I listen to you talk about some of the times around testing uh, and the availability of testing uh, in, in Italy right now, that still seems a lot better than what we're seeing in, in many parts of the United States even today. Uh, Joe, Art, let me bring you in on this. I mean, Art, you actually raised yourself the question of whose ability is it? Is it the hospital's responsibility, the government's responsibility? Uh, and you said we kind of worked it out during the crisis, but I'm not sure. This is really a question that's really been worked out. Uh, you know, I mean, the crisis has subsided right now in New York, but the questions that you're raising, you know, what's the national role, what's the state role, what's the hospital's right. role in actually getting all the needing, needed equipment, et cetera. Maybe talk about that a little bit from your perspective. No, I, I would be happy to. And, and, and you're right. When, when I said worked out, I, I, I mean, I, I, I think – 
we figured our way through it during the peak of the crisis, but there's been no resolution to sort of fundamental questions. I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna impress my, my former mm -hmm. professor here. On the United States, uh, uh, we, we, we typically talk about uh, federalism implying that we have um, uh, separation of powers, that certain powers are um, uh, reserved to the states, certain are granted to the, to the federal government. Uh, there's an there's an author, uh, an old author, Richard Neustadt, who used to talk, who, who talked instead about federalism in the United States being separated institutions sharing power, and I think that's actually more descriptive of what we see. And and the challenge occurs when the different institutions, in this case, the different institutions of government, the different layers of government, can't, can't come to some sort of an agreement about whose responsibility is what. And that's what Dr. Sparrow was, uh, was alluding to. And that's, that, is, that is what we experienced in real time uh, during, the, during the first wave uh, of the pandemic in New York. Um, my perspective, uh, uh, having, having gone through this, is number one, that public health in the first instance is the responsibility of the government, the federal government and the state governments, um, to to organize, to coordinate, and to fund. Hospitals are uh, uh, a part of the apparatus of public health, but I don't think hospitals in the first instance should be um, the entities that are organizing or driving public uh, 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 public health. Um, and the and and we saw in crystal in in, in crystal clarity, we saw why that's the case. So, you know, what ended up happening in, 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 in New York and in the United States during the, the initial uh, wave of the pandemic is that the federal government, the state governments, and hospitals were all competing with the same suppliers for um, personal protective equipment and for ventilators. Um, and, and, and it was literally a scrum uh, to be able to attain the requisite um, uh, supplies. And those hospitals that were better endowed, uh, uh, and the Mount Sinai Health System is a, is a, is a well-endowed health system, you know, they were able to secure the necessary equipment and supplies. The hospitals that were not as well endowed had challenges doing that. And, and, and in the end, we paid a premium for the fact that um, we were competing against each, against each other from a, from a supply chain perspective. So what really needed to have happened and what we really need to work out before the next pandemic, uh, quite candidly, is we need to properly understand the role of the federal government vis-a-vis -vis the state governments in addressing major public health issues, pandemics being, being one of them. And, you know, we have to assign responsibility in that context. And that's a, that's a give and take and back and forth, and that's going to take some time. But we've got to assign some responsibility for who ought to be doing what so that we don't repeat this particular problem. Um, you know, quite frankly, at, at, at using the Mount Sinai Health System as an example, we were very fortunate that we had uh, board members who had global connections that enabled us to create supply chains for personal protective equipment. It just shouldn't have come to that. I mean, we're, we're extremely grateful to our to our mem members of our board of trustees, and their coming through in that way enabled us to ensure the safety of our staff, which was critical to our being able to deliver the services that we needed to deliver. But but the reality is that it shouldn't have come to that. And 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 having run a public hospital previously. I can only imagine the challenges that public hospitals and less well-endowed health systems had in, sec in, in securing the same supply chains that we were able to, to secure. It can't be that way the next time we, we go through this, and there will be a next time. So we really have got to rethink the, 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 the levels of responsibility and who does what relative to public health. Um, and, and, and this is going to require a greater investment of the part of the government, federal government, state governments in the United States in their public health apparatus, or we will repeat the same challenges that we've, that we've encountered here um, uh, during this pandemic. Well, wow. Art, uh, not only do I agree with everything you just said, uh, the fact that you quoted Richard Neustadt on that, I mean, just escalated it even more. Uh, no, no that, that was really... That.
That was really terrific uh, and and thoughtful. And Joe, you're in a you know you're at Elmhurst, and Elmhurst uh, is part of the Mount Sinai system, but it's also part of the New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation, just sort of the quasi public agency that's responsible for essentially ensuring or making sure you know that it serves as the safety net for the the poorest of the poor and the most vulnerable and the neediest uh, in in New York City, and it's had that role for a long time. So not only do you have the federal government and the state government, but you're a sort of quasi part of the city, you know, of the local government as well. So mm-hmm. it's really a, a complicated set of intergovernmental dynamics, both public and private sector that you're dealing with. Maybe talk a little about some of these issues from, from your perspective. Yeah, I think um, there was a certain advantage in being in that network uh, of both Mount Sinai hospitals as well as public hospitals, and particularly with the public hospital system, they quickly made the um, decision to pull back stockpiles to a central location so that hospitals within our system weren't competing with each other for PPE, et cetera. I think though, the points that the other two speakers have made that we easily set up unfortunate and unhealthy competitions between areas uh, in our country. And I think we don't have a system that's really likely to be able to address that in any uh, time soon. I think the the national exercises, which are conducted more or less annually and are not usually very well publicized, they typically look at a biological event. And typically, the country fails. Um, there is not enough inter-state uh, uh, cooperation to contain infections, to share supplies, to control travel, all these things. They relearn that same lesson and then forget it over and over and over again. And I think we have to do something to, in a more formal way uh, than we saw with our own eyes, at least, in a more formal way, have the federal government uh, take more responsibility for s- supplies, for distributing supplies, for assuring that supplies are maintained, for being sure that states are not competing with each other, that systems within states are not competing with each other, because it just led to a an unnecessary degree of confusion and cost um, because of all of that. And I I think one thing that, as I mentioned uh, previously, we had volunteers from all over the place, including from all four branches of the military, but these volunteers would come in using all different types of PPE, much of which we had not really certified, authorized, recommended. It led to uh, some issues between our own staff and them. Uh, Each thought the other was being better protected, et cetera, et cetera. We now have an opportunity, at least in New York, while we're in a lull in all of this, to actually plan for what should be and what will be the appropriate PPE to stockpile it now within the system, within the state, within the country, in a more uniform, sane way. I mean, it's, it's just... Uh, shocking to me that we have to keep relearning that same lesson, that when we put states, hospital systems, and cities in competition with each other to get access to critical equipment, we're going to run into problems that way. There has to be more oversight into the entire problem nationally and statewide than we saw. And I, I think if this surges again to anything like the magnitude, we're going to see those same problems again. Hopefully, we'll be smart enough at this point to Um, focus on what was uh, needed and try to create a system that's much more user-friendly than that one was. There are certainly no shortage of international um, producers of various PPE that will step forward and charge a premium for their PPE, whether it's certified to be effective or not. We don't want to see that. It adds to the confusion and to the anxiety that surrounds this sort of outbreak. Right. No, that's really helpful. Thanks. Let me let me switch gears a little bit and ask, you know, during the pandemic, uh, at sort of the, the height of it, both in, in uh, and here in New York City, one of the things that we saw uh, was that many, many people who needed all sorts of what you might call essential health care were foregoing that care. They were not getting the cancer surgeries they were needed. They were not coming in for their preventive health care needs, et cetera. Um, you know, there were some efforts using telehealth, for example, to try to uh, accommodate some of those people who were, you know, unable to come into the actual hospital itself. But there are some things you can do by telehealth and some things you can't do by telehealth. 
as you think back on the pandemic and the height of it uh, in your communities, and as you think about the large cadre of people who either couldn't come in to the hospital because the hospital was not was telling them they can't come in, or they weren't coming in because they were afraid to come in, as you think about a potential resurgence, how do we deal with this question of you know all hands on deck and you know with respect to a pandemic, but we have a whole crew of people out there. I'm on a whole population of people who have healthcare needs, arguably up to the pandemic, but sort of delayed and forego care because of all the attention paid to the pandemic. Stefano, do you want to talk about that a little bit from from your perspective? I mean, obviously, you know, when you ha when you were treating when when 60, 70 percent of your beds were filled with uh, COVID-19 patients. Those beds were not filled with other people who had needs. I mean, how, how do you think about dealing with that kind of issue going forward? Oh, that, that's my major concern for the next future, to be honest. Uh, I'm really worried more of the fact that we will see the real effect of the delay in screening and in oncological care of the patient uh, in the next, uh, next months. So uh, we will see a big, big price for that. Uh, what should we have learned from that? Uh, we were able to, 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 to dedicate part of our hospital uh, to the urgent and oncological activities. But having said that, this doesn't mean that everything went smooth because, of course, the vast majority of the radiological procedures was actually occupied for the COVID-19 diagnosis, for all, all the overwhelmingly access of patients uh, everywhere in the hospital. Uh, you were saying 60%. Uh, the month of March, uh, we had uh, 600 COVID-related patients in the hospital out of a real capacity of 720. Uh, mm -hmm. Our hospital is a thousand bed hospital, but as I mentioned before, the gray area, the patient that needs to wait for his certified positivity or negativity needs to occupy an isolated ambient. And so the double occupancy room, they became single occupancy room. So mm -hmm. we were able to keep two or three important activities. Uh, pregnancy and deliveries. Uh, we had the regular number of newborns in that period in our hospital. So during March and April, we had close to 3,000 newborns. So because that area was kept totally free from COVID. Then we were able to keep most of the oncological and hematological medical therapy. Uh, but the surgical therapy was only dedicated for urgent patients. Now, the point is, what is and who is an oncological urgent patient? Because you end up treating patients that will actually have the chance to go out of the therapeutic windows in weeks or days, which is not exactly the best medicine you can apply for oncological therapy. So my answer is that the best possible organization should be a high flexibility of the system in having one uh, hospital uh, in each uh, macro area totally COVID free with specialists, either surgeon, hematologist, oncologist, any specialty needed for very urgent treatment that could actually move from one place to the other and keep those very urgent patients being treated and safe. Uh, and these need a lot of effort. Needs organization, flexibility, being available to operate in a different environment, very difficult. You can't do it as an emergency. You have to plan it. And I think we should plan something like that. We should have COVID-free units in which different specialty from different hospitals from that area should convey and give the right answer to people. It's very difficult, it's complicated because of course each one of us would probably choose to keep on doing what he is able to do.
and not doing something which is not in your in your heart. I mean, I'm not a pneumologist. I'm not an intensive care guy. I am an pathologist, a gastroenterology. I take care of transplant patient. I had to take courses and rounding during the night and during the day in team with other people, with gynecologists, oculists, and stuff people, and just take care of uh, pulmonary insufficiency. So you, we need to be flexible, but not only within your own hospital, because a pandemic needs all the territory. Thank you. No, I think that's that's right on point. I mean, Joe, or you know, when you think about sort of the overwhelming demands on your system every day. I mean, now you know you don't have a, a pandemic, at least here in New York City, right now in terms of sort of raging numbers, and you've got tremendous demands on your system. How do you cope with those demands, Joe? Maybe I'll switch. Let me start with you this time. I mean, how does Elmhurst sort of try to, you know, during that during that period in March and April when you were just dealing with COVID patient after COVID patient, what about those who had other kinds of needs and how are you thinking about that? In the well, we had a similar experience to what Dr. Fajal uh, described. We maintained our OBGYN services, our OB services, and we had the usual number of babies delivered during that time. But the other services, particularly um, radiation oncology services, chemotherapy that had to be administered in the hospital, um, there were some gaps uh, that developed, and we're now trying to understand exactly what that led to, what that meant. Um, we are uh, attracting those patients back into our system, but I think what Dr. Fajola just said <coughs> is really critically important. I think if we're going to be smart about this, we have to recognize that we have to develop hot facilities that are kept out of these crises so they can continue normal operations. Uh, and I think, you know, for example, with Ebola, where we had a whole handful of cases in this country, um, thank God, we had 50 hospitals that were the hospitals to accept Ebola patients. And every other hospital was going to be free to not accept them if, if, if possible. I think in a system like, in a situation like we confronted with COVID, we would have to try our absolute best to maintain a separate set of facilities to continue the acute and the chronic treatment of the other patients who need us. That may involve now planning to expand the hospital beds to have additional facilities created for that purpose, but I don't really see any way around that. We cannot always be in a position where the next outbreak, which may be COVID again or it may be something else, uh, overwhelms our ability to take care of the patients who normally need us. We have to create a system that is much more flexible than the one that we're in right now. So I agree with everything um, Dr. Pichello just said. Uh, thank you, Joe. Art, right, you know, your your title, you know, your role within the Mount Sinai system is the, the chief transformation officer for the system. So you're really, I think your job in part is to think about these sort of system-wide you know, approaches, and, and you're also thinking about organizational culture. I mean, I know Stefano was talking about, you know, sort of all of the reallocation of, of, of expertise, you know, people who sort of were urologists who suddenly were on the lines, you know, in the emergency room, et cetera, et cetera. From a, a system-wide basis, as you think about going forward and preparing either for the next COVID, you know, resurgence or for the next crisis of this sort, how is Mount Sinai and how are you thinking about transforming sort of what Mount Sinai is to accommodate these kind of crises? So a, a number of observations. Um, number one, relative to culture, I, I think the investments that we made as a system in cultural transformation, cultural alignment, um, actually played a critical role in our being able to get through this. Um, and, and, I, and, I, and I say that because, you know, we've spent a lot of time as a health system emphasizing certain values amongst them, uh, agility as an example, um, uh, leveraging lean as a robust process improvement methodology and expanding its utilization across the system. And, and, and our ability to tap uh, the, the, the values of the system and to tap uh, knowledge about a robust process improvement um, were, were critical, I think, in our ability to organize our staff to solve problems quickly, 
um, to be able to uh, uh, adjust as new things are being thrown at us. Um, and in, 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 in created the level of, I think, trust and support between management and frontline staff that was essential for our being able to get through some very, very uh, difficult times. Those investments combined with uh, a lot of work on internal communication um, and uh, a, a reward and recognition of our frontline staff and the deployment of mental health and other resources to support staff uh, were, were, again, all critical elements of our ability to respond proactively to the uh, to the pandemic. So, so that that's what I wanted to say about culture. I think, in terms of uh, of, of of thinking about how we're organized and, and how we might um, deal a little bit differently with a second wave or a, a different pandemic or a different uh, public health problem, um, and, and not lose our ability to deliver services to critical services to our patients. I I, I would make a few points first. Uh, we, are, we are, particularly for an airborne um, illness, uh, we're going to have to figure out ways to um, uh, uh, create triage areas in our emergency departments um, to be able to separate patients so that um, people who are coming to the emergency department feel safe. Uh, you know, our sort of standard emergency room visits went down precipitously as our COVID emergency room visits went up equally precipitously. And, you know, and that's a completely understandable reaction. But the problem is that we had people who were ill uh, foregoing care, many of whom died in their homes um, and, and, and died unattended because they made the choice to stay at home and not risk exposure to COVID. So we're going to have to figure that out, whether that is creating sort of hot uh, uh, facilities, uh, as was discussed earlier, or whether that's creating uh, additional triage space for our emergency departments. I don't know the answer, but we're going to have to come up with something because the emergency departments were 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 uh, um, just battle zones during during COVID, and 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 people understandably made decisions to forego care as opposed to 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 come to the emergency departments. Second. Um, you know, I think we do have a much better sense now of how we would triage and I'm sorry, how we would um, surge and where we would put our uh, COVID positive patients or, or and, and where we would put patients who are not. But critical to being able to do that, and the United States is still not there on this issue, and, and uh, Dr. Sparrow, you raised it earlier. Critical to being able to do that is to be able to have uh, 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 readily available rapid testing. You know, one of the major challenges that we faced in in addressing the the pandemic was the fact that we would have to we would have patients in our emergency department and on the units um, who were under investigation, um, but whose status as a COVID positive patient was uh, or, or negative patient was unknown for a, a you know for a, 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 at least twenty four hours, and you know that's too long. So uh, we have to figure out in the future how to focus resources at, 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 and whether this is at the federal level or where have you, we have to focus resources on, on, on attempting to develop uh, and deploy rapid testing. Um, rapid testing would be a game changer in the utilization of scarce resources in a hospital um, uh, during the pandemic. If we, if we had that, our ability to manage these patients would have been different and our ability to be able to take care of COVID positive patients and regular patients who need care would have been vastly improved. Um, I, I think I, I would also, know, I want to note one other thing, and at least in the United States and certainly in New York, the, the pandemic exposed the disparities in, 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 in health care uh, and health status between our uh, uh, black and brown population and our white population between our you know very vulnerable pop population from a socioeconomic standpoint and our our wealthier population and um, you know the disparities played themselves out uh, predictably um, where uh, your communities of color were much harder hit 
Um, and, and because your community colors were, were, communities of color were much harder hit, the population of patients that were coming into the hospitals and were suffering and dying from COVID were disproportionately um, uh, uh, black and brown. Um, we, we've got to make the investments in our vulnerable communities to avoid those types of disparities in the future. That is a long-term play. That's not something that's gonna happen immediately. It took a long time to get to this point. It's gonna take a long time to unwind, but we can't forget that. And, and I bring it up because uh, you know, one of the issues, and this was mentioned earlier, one of the issues that we're dealing with now is the fact that telemedicine um, went from being sort of on the fringe in New York to being in, in, in increasingly accepted as a moda by patients as a modality of receiving care. And that's fantastic, but what one, as was noted, you know, telemedicine can't, can't address every condition. There are certain conditions you have to come in for. And number two, if we're not careful, five years from now, somebody's gonna do a study and they're gonna conclude that there are disparities in accessing telemedicine and that those disparities track the underlying healthcare disparities that we already see in our vulnerable communities. So one of the things that I've been urging at, at, at Mount Sinai is let's get ahead of that curve. We know that that's what's gonna happen if we don't change the way we do things. So let's get ahead of that curve and let's start to think about where there are, for example, broadband deserts, where there are uh, places within the city where people can't access um, you know, Wi-Fi in the same way that in wealthier areas they can. And let's see if we can address that up front. Um, and, and again, I do think this is actually a role for the government to be playing. Um, uh, uh, certainly we can partner with the government, but I think it's critically important if, if telemedicine is gonna be the modality of the, one of the key modalities of the future, let's get ahead of that curve and let's not recreate disparities. Let's level the playing field so that the next time there's a problem and we have to rely even more heavily on telemedicine, we can do so with the assurance that we're not doing it in a way that is that is reinforcing already pre-existing um, disparities in, in health status. Right. No, thank you, Art. I mean, I think it's really, you know, I really appreciate you bringing up the issue of disparities and you're bringing up the issue of equity and, and sort of the relationship to, of race to public health and health care, particularly in, in the United States. Uh, but I think in different ways, this discussion itself, I think everywhere around the world, uh, so really thank you for that. And I think you raised really important questions. And I think you're right. That study will be done in five years. It'll probably be done sooner. And unfortunately, it will show some of the kind of disparities. Uh, but I think the more we can do to lessen some of those disparities and to set in place, you know, systems to try to, to do that, I think the better off we'll be. I want to, we have about five minutes left. And I'm just scanning some of the uh, questions that have been posed by some of the participants. Let me, let me ask one, but I'm going to add a piece to it. Uh, Elisabetta Trinchero, I have this in front of me, asks, what was the hardest decision you made? And so what I want to ask is both, what was the hardest decision you had to make back during the height of the pandemic? And what scares you the most uh, about sort of a, a potential second wave coming right now or in the short in the short term? So Stefano, what was the hardest decision you had to made and make and what scares you the most? Well, I have to pick because I have so many moments in which I have been scared that it's truly difficult. But uh, I, I want to pick one. Uh, uh, and, and the reason is that I'm, I can easily laugh about being scared for that decision today uh, because I knew that there was no reason to be scared. But at that time, I was truly scared. Uh, it was... Uh, February 26, I remember, it was my wife's birthday. Uh, we were supposed to have dinner, and uh, but I just realized that the, the, the outburst was coming so quickly that we had to transform much more sides of the hospital than we would expect. And so I realized that we would have never had enough trained physicians to do that. And so with a couple of friends, I was in charge of setting up the system. And the decision is, should we ask an 
a gynecologist, an oculist, to take care of a patient with a P on F of 75, uh, in, in close to being on a Venturi mask or a CPAP helmet, and taking the decision, should we bring this patient in the ICU or not, or <laughs> is this patient too far away from any help from the system, and I should not use either ventilation or helmet CPAP for this patient because it's just not to be good for him and for the system. And, you know, if you have an intensive care guy or a good pneumologist to do that, you are in good hands. But then I was asked to build teams of 12 people for each 48 beds units. So we had eight dedicated COVID 48 beds units with each one with 12 people rotating on the switch eight hours a day and there was just one trained physician and the other were like me, a, a gastroenterologist or an oculist or a dentist. We also had people from the staff, administrative staff of the hospital, which were physicians, and they actually came and helped. And so that was a scary moment. I mean, am I stretching it too much, asking those people right. to do this? Is it going to be an even greater damage? And so that, that's why at that time we called it war medicine. Uh, it's not going to be the best medicine in absolute term. It is the best medicine you can deliver in those given conditions. And today, I laugh of my fear of those days because those people were so fantastic that the care that they gave to those patients was excellent in terms of life saved and organization, uh, setting aside the, the part that you had the chance to see on a different light all the people working with you. And I have to say, I fell in love with most of the people, the nurses and the physician, because I realized that patient and availability and resilience were the real solution for our crisis. And so my fear was stupid, but I'm happy to realize that. Right. No, that that's, that's really a, that's a powerful, powerful uh, recollection uh, and, and lesson. I think some real lessons there. We have just a couple of minutes left, uh, and I'd love to hear how, how this all affected you personally, too, but I think we're out of time. Joe, what was the hardest decision you had to make, and is Elmhurst ready for another resurgence? Well, I would certainly agree um, with Dr. Pajoli on, on how hard the decision was to assign people with no background in acute care uh, medicine to these units. I was also involved in that. But I was thinking of the pregnant women, uh, many of whom were COVID positive when they came in, many of whom were asymptomatically COVID positive, and what to do with them when it came time for discharge, how well to um, uh, acquaint them with their newborn, et cetera. These were all very, very difficult decisions. And I don't know that we made the right judgments in these, but they were particularly difficult. And many of these women left the hospital still on oxygen, and it was these obviously a different population than most of the other patients. They were young, they were female, uh, they had major responsibilities that they had to take on at home. That was very, very challenging. And I won't go into all the answers and solutions that we attempted to come up with, but I found that very chilling to try to work our way through that. Uh, and as far as are we prepared for the next um, one of these, uh, I think we have to keep in mind the all hazards approach. I think one danger is that we would prepare again for exactly the same thing that hit us this time. And, you know, this had unique features of uh, communicability for the uh, inadequacy of testing, et cetera, and we may be all prepared for another surge of COVID and lose track of the other possible um, uh, things that we may see. I, I think I would love to, with this group, spend hours talking about how we could create more, more of a, a flexible system within our various, uh, you know, systems that we work in to really make it truly all hazards so we don't have to reinvent the wheel uh, over and over again uh, but we also don't just extract the lessons of COVID and apply them to everything. Great, thanks. And Monica, if I could sort of ask of Bacconi and, and the uh, webinar folks if we could have another minute or two, I, I would just love to hear Art's uh, reflections both on one of the hardest decisions he had to make uh, and his feelings about whether or not Mount Sinai as a system uh, is, is, is ready for a resurgence. 
Sure, and I'll, and I'll keep it very, very brief, Michael. Uh, in, in terms of the hardest decision, I, I uh, uh, and, and and my decision making is at a little at a different level. It's a level removed from my my, my clinical colleagues. But I will say that there was a point in time, I think it was mid-March, where we had converted our units, um, and so we had dedicated you know, COVID units, and we sort of erased what these units were doing previously. Um, and we, we uh, utilized team-based nursing where we were attaching um, uh, med surge nurses to critical care uh, uh, nurse leaders. So, you know, we would create teams mm -hmm. where, uh, uh, similar to what was discussed earlier, where you had, you, you were, med surge nurses were going to be going into um, and, and doing nursing that they weren't that experienced with at all um, under the leadership of a, of a critical care nurse. And I remember going to the huddle um, uh, uh, on, on uh, I think it was 7 East was the unit. And, you know, you look around, and at the time, nobody really knew, you know, we still don't know a lot about the virus, but at that point, we know we knew virtually nothing. And because we knew nothing, we didn't know its lethality. We didn't know whether, you know, these nurses were essentially uh, uh, walking into a death trap. We had no idea. And, I, you know, you look around and everybody is, uh, with a couple of exceptions, is real young. You know, and, and I remember looking around, noticing the age of the nurses um, and saying to myself that this has got to be what it's like when you're, you know, a, a, uh, a commander in the, in the army and you're deploying people um, to a fight, the result of which you, you don't know. Um, and the, the casualties from which um, you can only guess. And, and so that was a pretty powerful moment. Um, I mean, it turned out that that we were, you know, the, the PPE was was protective, and that our staff, though many contracted COVID, um, we only had, uh, I think it was two. We had two deaths uh, amongst our staff, um, and 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 obviously we mourned those two deaths. But at the time, again, we had no idea. What, we had no idea what was going to happen. Um, in terms of whether we're ready for a new uh, a, a second wave. I mean, I think we're as ready as we could conceivably be in the context of what we know today and what we what we understand to be the roles of the of the different levels of the government. Um, you know, we have our we've we've secured our PPE supply chain. We have our ventilators. We have our surge plans. Um, we have our predictive modeling. Uh, we we know a lot more now in terms of medicine, in terms of what medicine to utilize on. On, on COVID patients. Um, we have our social distancing plans. We, we have our other protective plans. We have our incident command structure ready to deploy if, if we need to revert back to that. So, you know, we, we, are, we are as prepared as we can be for the virus as we know it and the conditions that we understand them to be at this point. Wow. Listen, I think, uh, as Joel just said, we could have the three of you easily for another hour or two hours or more. I think the, the lessons that you have suggested are really important. The examples that you've given are really powerful. Uh, with some apologies to those who've asked questions on the chat uh, that I just didn't have a chance to get to today. There were really interesting questions there as well. Uh, Monica, thank you so much and the folks at Bocconi for organizing this webinar, for working with us at Columbia for the break more generally. We're really excited about this webinar and, and how it went. We're also really excited about working with you on the hospital simulation going forward. Uh, let me turn to you, Monica, to see if you have any, any closing words for us. Uh, but thank you to Art, Joe, thank and Stefano. You. It was just a brilliant discussion. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, but thank you also to our guests and also to the participants. Uh, they contributed also with uh, some questions and also a comment that I am about to read. I would like also to thank some people uh, in the backstage, let's say, in particular John Winterman and also Viviana Mangiaterra, who are from uh, the Mainman School and, the, and Da Bocconi, and they are the directors of our simulation. And I mean, I, I agree, I think they can agree with me by saying that we have a lot of food and we have a, a lot of insights in order to enrich our simulation of December. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And a last sentence that I wanted to steal from one of our participants. 
who wrote down this message. This is an experience that has shown that we must make the right decisions, choose the best technology, but we must not forget the teaching of Hippocrates. So thank you. This sentence, in my opinion, summarizes how much important is important is to combine management, but also the teaching of Hippocrates. And you very well demonstrated this. Thank you so much. And thank you to thank uh, you very Michael. much. Thanks everybody. Thank you all. Bye bye. Thank you all. Thank you all. Bye -bye. Thank you all. Thank you all.